Hey guys, James Sane here. So today I want to talk about pulmonary artery catheters. So I've been a nurse for 30 plus years. I started out in a general ICU and then I worked respiratory ICU and I worked in CCU. So when I was in CCU, at least 50% of the patients had pulmonary artery catheters or Swan Gans. So Edwards Life Science makes a catheter called a Swan Gans invented by Dr. Swan and his assistant uh, Gans. So everybody had them uh, back in the 80s and 90s. And then some over the years, uh, they became where they weren't very commonplace. And nurses are not comfortable. New nurses or nurses less than 10 years been in ICU, it's intensive care units for the last 10 years. They don't, they don't know how to manage uh, pulmonary artery catheters. So if you work in a unit where um, PA catheters, pulmonary artery catheter, catheters are new to you, I want to give you some information. I'm going to give you a, a, an overview on the catheters and why they're important. Uh, they give you a lot of diagnostic information, and you know they're, they're, they're nothing to cause anxiety. It's like anything else. Once you get used to doing it, then it becomes uh, fairly routine, fairly easy, but everything's hard until you know how to do it. So what's a pulmonary artery catheter? So let's look on this screen here. Oh, and, and by the way, so when you're in intensive care, you'll, you'll call them um, pulmonary artery catheters. Or uh, when, when people go to the cath lab, it may be called a right heart catheterization. So it's the same thing. Um, the only difference when you have your patient in intensive care, you've put your catheter out into the pulmonary artery and you're taking the various uh, types of measurements that you can do, which we do the exact same thing in the cath lab, which that's, that's where I work now. So I had all those years of uh, various ICU, then I've been in the cath lab for a number of years. Um, but when in the cath lab, we do what's called a right heart catheterization, which is inserting a pulmonary artery catheter. Uh, it may not necessarily be a Swan Gans made by Edwards Life Science. Uh, Arrow makes a, a, a PA catheter. Uh, there's a Berman catheter. Um, but we call it a right heart catheterization because we do a few extra things where we take oxygen levels from different chambers of the heart. Uh, one, we may be doing fit cardiac output as opposed to at the bedside, you'll do the TD, thermodilutional cardiac output, through your PA catheter, or you may have a continuous uh, cardiac output component to your... There's, there's a number of different uh, PA catheters with a number of different op, op, uh, options. Uh, it just depends what kind of catheter was put in. Um, so in the cath lab, we are uh, checking for uh, shunts, which you, uh, you don't do that at the bedside. So we're checking to see, is there an atrial septal defect uh, between the right atrium and the left atrium? We're looking to see, is there a ventricular septal defect from the uh, right ventricle to the left ventricle? Some cath labs, they may still do thermodilutional cardiac outputs, which you will do at the bedside. Or some cath labs do FIC, where I happen to work now. Uh, we do FIC cardiac output. And if you want to see a video on FIC cardiac output, I'll leave a, a link in the description for, for doing FIC cardiac output. But let's take a look at these pulmonary artery catheters. So here on the screen, um, you'll have a catheter. And this is, this is a, a cartoon drawing of a catheter coming in into the um, superior vena cava. So this is a venous uh, approach, and it doesn't matter. I'll say this because in the, in the cath lab, well, you know, we may, like when we're giving a report to somebody where, we do left heart catheterization, right heart catheterization. That that doesn't have anything to do with where you accessed the body, the right groin, the left groin, right radial, left radial. So just real quick, a left heart catheterization, we're going through the arterial system and we're looking at the arteries on the heart. So it, it, it doesn't matter what artery you go in. It's usually going to be femoral or radial. You could do brachial, I guess. Uh, some people do that occasionally. But all the arteries, when you go uh, retrograde, they all lead back to the aorta, and you go retrograde up the aorta to the left and right main uh, coronary artery. On a pulmonary artery catheter, it's a venous approach, so all the veins, if you come, if you do jugular, 
Or if you do a subclavian approach, all those veins lead back to the superior vena cava. If you do femoral uh, venous approach, and it doesn't matter if it's a right femoral vein or a left femoral vein, they all lead back to the um, uh, inferior vena cava. So the inferior vena cava and the um, a superior vena cava, they both empty into the right atrium. Um, so I'll put a slide up. So talking about the blood flow, you, you, you need to understand how the blood flows through the heart. So the vena cava is returned to the right atrium. There's no valve um, between the vena cavas and the right atrium, and then blood travels from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, out the RV outflow track in uh, through the pulmonic artery. So now you're into the pulmonary artery, which is the only artery in the body carrying unoxygenated blood. So then the pulmonary artery where your catheter will sit out and rest into the pulmonary artery. Now, when you're in the, pul the PA, the pulmonary artery, um, it's, it's looking at the pressure um, in the pulmonary artery. And there is a balloon on the tip of the pulmonary artery catheter. If you blow that balloon up, it makes it the catheter blind to everything behind it. And so the the one of the one of the important informations that you get with a pulmonary artery catheter is that you're checking pressures in different chambers of the heart. So one very important pressure is is called the LVEDP or the left ventricular end pressure. So when you do a wedge pressure, when you blow up the balloon, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but when you blow up the balloon and the PA catheter is looking for it, it's looking through the pulmonary vasculature. So as long as there's no abnormal, uh, like if you have a pulmonary embolus, well, then the pressure is going to be higher in the pulmonary vasculature. And so it won't accurately reflect because when the pulmonary blood returns to, after it gets oxygenated, the pulmonary veins, which there's no valve between the pulmonary vasculature and the pulmonary veins returning to the left atrium, and the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, there's no valve. And then from the left atrium, you go through the mitral valve, and when the mitral valve is open, you're looking into the left ventricle at the end of diastole. So that's what the wedge pressure, it estimates the LVEDP. And so people use this as a measurement of are you overhydrated, underhydrated. If your LVEDP or if your wedge is below a certain level, your physicians will be ordering fluid. Or if your LVEDP or your wedge is higher than a certain number, you're probably going to be giving a diuretic, more likely Lasix. But let's look at this cartoon drawing of approaching from the superior vena cava, this catheter enters into the right atrium. There's no valve here. So now and when the, when the catheter is inserted, it's, uh, it's going with the flow of blood. So you inflate a balloon so that it tr helps travel the catheter uh, forward. And oftentimes you have to use a wire. But that's, you, well, you might be doing placement at the bedside. We used to do it all the time, place it at the bedside. And you go by these waveforms down here. How, how do you know where you are? In, in the cath lab, we look at the waveforms, and we also have the, uh, the added benefit of using fluoro. So the catheter goes into the right atrium, travels through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, and we measure pressures when we're in the right atrium, and we measure the pressure here. This is what our, an atrial pressure looks like. And then when we get into the right ventricle, the waveform changes to this right here, and this is an RV um, uh, pressure. And then the catheter is directed out through the pulmonic valve, and now we get to the pulmonary artery. So, And it doesn't matter if it rests out in the main branch of the left pulmonary artery or the main branch of the right pulmonary artery. In this cartoon drawing, they drew it out into the left, uh, and more often it wants to go to the right pulmonary vein um, because of the nature of the takeoff of the right pulmonary vein and the left pulmonary vein, I mean artery. Um, so when you get to the PA, the pulmonary artery, this is what your waveform is, a very characteristic waveform. And then when this catheter gets all the way out here and it can't go any further, it's called a wedge uh, because the balloon is 
uh, up against the wall of the, um, the small pulmonary vasculature, and it's looking forward into the, um, the vascular bed of the, of the pulmonary artery. And then you get this characteristic-looking um, wedge. Now, this wedge pressure is estimating what the left atrial pressure is. So note that a right atrial pressure looks exactly like a left atrial pressure or a wedge. It's just that these pressures are normally higher. These pressures are normally lower. And just like when you do an RV um, uh, pressure, you won't do an LV. We do an LV pressure every time in the cath lab. The LV characteristics of the waveform look just like an RV, except the LV is higher pressure, the RV is lower pressure, but the waveforms have the same uh, components to them. And then when you're out in the pulmonary artery, it is an artery. This looks just like if you're used to looking at your AO waveform or your, you know, your, if you have an arterial line, your typical systolic and diastolic and your diacrotic notch where um, if you have an arterial line, it's where the aortic valve closes. If you have a, a PA line, this is where the pulmonic valve closes. But this is just a smaller pressure in the pulmonary artery, same characteristics compared to an arterial pressure. So let's take a look at a, an animation from Edwards Life Science from their, um, uh, their website about a swan gans catheter being placed. I'll play it through once and then talk about it. Okay, so some nice visuals. Let's play that again one more time, and, and I'll make a couple of comments. So on, I know we haven't looked at a pulmonary artery catheter yet, but there is, it's, it's typically a red, um, a red tubing, and it comes with this, this slider where you can lock it. You blow up the balloon, and you should only use this syringe because this syringe will only hold 1.5 cc's. So you should only use the syringe that comes with the catheter to inflate the balloon. Now, occasionally in the cath lab, a physician may put more than 1.5 cc's in the balloon, but you should never do that. You can, um, you can cause um, pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, so you, I, me, you as a nurse, me as a nurse, I'm not allowed to put more than 1.5 cc's of air into that um, the balloon of the catheter. And when you do wedge pressures, um, which you'll do, it depends on your institution. We used to do them every two hours or every four hours, but I, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. The pulmonary artery diastolic pressure, so you have a systolic, a diastolic, and you have a wedge pressure, and you also have a mean pressure. But the PAD, the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure, is very close to what the wedge pressure is. So after you take a number of wedge pressures and see, oh, it does correlate to the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure, you may not do wedges as often. You may go by the PAD, the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure, whether you're giving fluid or whether you're giving Lasix. But let's look at this video again. So they're blowing up the balloon on the Swan Gans catheter, and now it is introduced into the right atrium, and that's typically where you inflate the balloon. And then the catheter passes through the tricuspid valve. Oh, also we have this characteristic atrial waveform here. Now the, the catheter's now it's passing through the tricuspid valve and it just entered the RV. So we have this characteristic right ventricular waveform. Now it's going out the RV, uh, the outflow track, and it just got to the uh, pulmonic valve. And then note here when it crosses the um, pulmonic valve, we're still in the right ventricle, crosses into the pulmonary artery, we'll see this characteristic change uh, 
NRP to a PA waveform. Now, this is a classic PA look of a waveform. The catheter gets advanced all the way out until this is wedged, hence the name. It's wedged up against the wall. And then you turn into this characteristic waveform here. It looks like a, an, an atrial, not an arterial. It looks like an atrial waveform. And here in this animation, they're just deflating the balloon. It will go back to a PA waveform. Here they pull back. They inflate the balloon, but it doesn't change. And now they go as far as they can until it changes into... And that's how they know that's where we're going to leave the catheter because this is where we get a wedge. Um, and then it's, the balloon's deflated. This is just our PA waveform. So that's a nice uh, animation of what's going on. Uh, so you don't have to have fluoro to put in a um, to put in pulmonary artery catheters. We used to do it all, all the time at the bedside. All right, so let's take a look at some components of a PA catheter. Okay, so there are a number of different types of swung against catheters. This is one of the most basic catheters. It's a cartoon drawing of, of a swung against catheter with the balloon inflated. So let's look at some of the components of the catheter. Here you have a proximal, as the, even all the catheters will have a proximal and a distal port. So the proximal port is blue, and it opens up uh, where this opens up is in the right atrium. So you can use it for infusions or you could use it to measure pressures in the right atrium, which would be the same thing as a CVP, a central venous pressure. The um, yellow port is the distal port. You never infuse anything through there. It's transduced and it gives you your pulmonary artery pressure. And then when you blow up the balloon, and I'll talk a little bit about this in just a second, when you blow up the balloon here, and if the balloon is out far enough in the pulmonary artery so that it occludes, the, the balloon gets pushed up against the walls of the smaller artery, so that this distal tip is blind to all the pressures behind it, and it's looking forward out into the pulmonary vasculature, and then it's looking into the left atrium, and then when the mitral valve is open, it's looking into the left ventricular endostatic pressure, which is the whole point of a, of a, of a wedge. Uh, you may see it written like here, pulmonary, PAWP, pulmonary artery wedge pressure. You may see it PAOP, pulmonary artery occlusive pressure. A lot of times you'll see it, this is what I see the most, is PCWP, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So they all mean the same thing. Um, just different ways of saying the same thing. If you can do thermodilutional cardiac outputs, um, this connects to the cardiac output machine so that when you inject through the blue, sometimes people get confused. But you have to, so what well, I'll, I'll show a quick video uh, on cardiac output. So I'll come back to cardiac output. But let's look at some other types of swan gans catheters. Okay, so here. This is off uh, Edwards Life Science website. So here is another cat. This has a lot to it. So they have, uh, this is where you inflate the balloon to do your wedge. Your same distal port, just like the one I was just showing you. The same blue port like the one I was showing you. But then it has an additional port, uh, a uh, VIP hub. It's for infusions. Um not shown in here. Sometimes there's a pace port so that you can do uh, pacing through it. The thermistor connector here, this is connecting up to do cardiac output uh, where you are injecting. By the way, when, when you're hooked up, when you do cardiac outputs, it's, it's typically a closed system. So you have a series of stopcocks. Then you have to figure out, do you have uh, off-handle off stopcocks or the other kind of stopcocks? So... But you want to keep it closed. You, it needs to stay sterile because you're, in, you know, you're injecting in, into the, the the right atrium, uh, and it travels out. You, know, you don't you don't want to you don't want to make the patient septic. Um, this has this one has a thermal filament connector. This is so it can do because it has this thermal filament where it, it can do continuous cardiac output for you. Uh, that that didn't exist back when I was at the bedside. So at some point they came out.
where you don't have to do the injection. It will it will heat up some blood here um, to a known temperature, and by the time that heated up blood gets to the sensor up here, um, there's a change in temperature. And through the magic of what engineers do, which I don't, I don't pretend to understand how they, um, but you take a known like when you do a cardiac output, you take a known volume of um, a fluid at a certain temperature, you inject it at the proximal port. By the time it gets to the distal port, the temperature has changed, and through the magic of engineering, you can tell what the cardiac output is or how many liters a minute um, the patient's heart pumps, which is what cardiac output is. Uh, this also has a uh, an SVO2 connector. So... Um, so SVO2, I would see that more. I, we didn't use those so much in CCU, but all the, all the post-cabbage patients, the bypass, ACB, whatever you want to call it, the bypass surgery, they would all have that. So what is, here, I'll bring this up. So what is SVO2? It's a global indicator of O2 consumption and delivery. So it's the amount of oxygen left over after the tissues have extracted whatever they need. So SVO2 is so SVO2 is a more sensitive uh, indicator. Um, so if you're looking at your SVO2, uh, it will drop first before, like if you have a pulse ox on the finger, the SVO2 is a, a more sensitive indicator. Kind of like when you're sedating a patient, and let's say the entitled CO2 is a little more sensitive than the pulse oximeter. You'll see changes in your entitled CO2 first. So same thing here. So you can um, monitor your uh, your your SVO2. Um, all the SVO2 is it's a, it's what's called a mixed venous. So a normal SVO2, depending on where you look, is like sixty to seventy or sixty-five to seventy-five percent oxygen level. So when you, your blood comes to your lungs, it gets oxygenated. It travels out to all the organs that it does. And then as it travels back to the heart, the true mixed venous is blood from the pulmonary artery catheter when the balloon is deflated. So in the cath lab, if you're doing fit cardiac output, you, that's, your, that's the only blood that counts as the mixed, uh, the mixed venous blood drawn from the pulmonary artery catheter with the balloon deflated. So that should be normal, 60 to 75%. 65 to 75. Um, if it's a lot lower, then that means your oxygen delivery is too low or your oxygen demand that the patient is using is really high. So you've got to find a way to decrease the oxygen demand as the patient's going through their illness or sickness or basically find a way to deliver more oxygen, which is bad if you're already on 100% oxygen and then your SVO2 is low, then you can't supply the oxygen that you want. Um, but I digress a little bit getting off the, um, the swan gans. Also, it's nice to point out here, all the swans have, well, from Edwards Life Science anyway, they have uh, markings so that as you're putting the catheter in, the, f the single, the small black line is 10 centimeters. So we have 10. You can't really see it so well because of here, but you get here with three, three lines, 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters, and then a larger solid black line is 50 centimeters. 60, 70, 80, 90, two solid black lines is 100 centimeters. Why is that important? Okay, well, the reason that's important, because as your advanced, if you were doing this without fluoro, so it's good to know this information, depending on where you're coming from, the internal jugular, the subclavian, the femoral vein, uh, the right AC, the left AC, that the distance to the vena cava right atrial junction is this many centimeters. So, like if you were putting this catheter in at the bedside, and let's just say, what do you want? Let's do a vein approach. So, when you get about 30 centimeters of the catheter in, so as you're putting this catheter through a sheath, and your catheter is at 30 centimeters, and say, well, I don't, I don't have an RA pressure, let's, and you're out to 40 centimeters, you still don't have an RA pressure, it's coiling up somewhere. Well, Usually you don't have a problem getting to, to the right atrium. It's usually getting out of the right ventricle. So if you were saying, well, how, how far is it to the, to the PA? If you, in this example, we're talking about a femoral vein, it takes about 60 centimeters to get to the pulmonary artery. So if you were putting this catheter in 
and you got your RA pressure, and then you put it in 60 centimeters, and now you've put it in at 70 centimeters, and you still have an RA pressure, uh, I guess you could have a really super enlarged right atrium, but more likely, I mean right ventricle, but more likely the catheter is coiling up and looping up in the right ventricle. That, that's like a common thing that you see uh, with the benefit of using fluoro. So you can put it at the bedside. Well, I mean, I don't know if people know how to do it anymore. But we used to do it at the bedside all the time. It's, of course, it's easier with fluoro. You can see where it's going. Um, so it's also good to note that if you're putting this in at the bedside, you know what the normal pressures look like. So I've already gone over. I won't do it again, but you have a right atrial pressure. There's the catheter in the right atrium. Catheter is in the right ventricle. There's your RV, and the catheter makes it out to the pulmonary artery, and that's a typical PA pressure. And then when it's wedged, your typical wedge pressure. I will point out, so I will point out, if you're inserting this without uh, uh, flow, well, it doesn't matter if you're inserting it, but as you're inserting the, 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 the catheter, note that the right atrial pressure, which is usually like 0 to 8, um, is pretty close to close to the the end diastolic pressure, the RV end diastolic pressure. Uh, this is the beginning diastolic pressure. So your right atrial pressure is about the same as your uh, RV EDP, and then your RV systolic pressure is about the same as your PA systolic pressure, and your PA diastolic pressure is about the same as your wedge pressure. So there are some things, if you have some valve problems, some regurg or some stenosis where this isn't true, but once you determine that your PA diastolic pressure is about the same as your wedge pressure, this is why this PAD can be used as an indicator for your wedge, and then you will treat the patient appropriately when it comes to giving more fluid or giving diuretics. The last part I want to talk about here in this portion, we talked about cardiac output. So let's look real quick. So real quick, let's take a look at cardiac output. This is animation from Edwards Life Science uh, website. The thermodilutional is the most common type of cardiac output. We, we do thick cardiac output in my lab. But thermodilutional is the least accurate when you have a low cardiac output, and it is the most accurate when you have a high cardiac output. The thick cardiac output is most accurate in low cardiac output, but you will not be doing thick cardiac output at the bits. Okay, and so one thing I do want to point out, now this is nowhere near a comprehensive um, talk on PA catheters. It's really an introduction if this gets, gets introduced into your critical care unit, um, just so that you have some, a basic overview. Um, now, when we talk about atrial waveforms, not arterial. So I mean, atrial is right atrium, left atrium, and the wedge is estimating a left atrial. So we're looking at the A wave and the V wave in a mean. So you have A wave, V. So the numbers that read out on your monitor is A wave, V wave, and the mean. When we look at, and again, if you want, you can really get into the minutia, which I do in this video. If you want to see this video here about how to interpret A waves and V waves and the X1 descent, X2 descent, the Y descent, and what the A wave means, what the V wave means, whether it's atrial contraction, atrial filling, uh, check out that video. If you have ventricular waveforms, and this is really more for cath lab um, because you won't have ventricular waveforms but you have a systolic beginning diastolic and end diastolic. You don't do a mean on the ventricle because it's, it's meaningless. It's not, I mean, you could calculate it, but it's a meaningless number that nobody uses. So ventricular pressures are systolic beginning diastolic and end diastolic, and nobody really cares too much about the beginning diastolic. It's really the end diastolic pressure that you care about. And um, – on arterial waveforms, and so you will be looking at PA waveforms. So your monitor will read out systolic and diastolic and mean. Um, 
just like when you have an AO pressure, the diacritic notch is the closure of the aortic valve on a PA, a pulmonary artery waveform. You have a diacritic notch. It's the closure of the pulmonic valve. And then again, to reiterate that a wedge pressure is estimating a, an, an atrial, a left atrial pressure, which is estimating left ventricular endocytic pressure. So you read your wedge for A wave, V wave, and mean. All right, guys, so that was just a brief overview of uh, PA pressure. So if it some, becomes something that you start doing in your unit, it's not anything to uh, cause anxiety. It's uh, especially if you have a, a, a swan that does uh, SVO2 as well as continuous cardiac output. And then it also had the VIP. It also gives you an extra port because you're going to need an extra port. If they're sick enough to have a swan, you're going to have infusions. So, but it, it gives you a wealth of information to know how you know, to, so that you know how to treat the patient and if the treatment that you're doing is working or not. Um, now, I didn't get into any of the, you know, there's troubleshooting of the, of the waveforms, what to do when you have certain waveforms, um, uh, where your transducer sits because your transducer not being leveled uh, will throw off your readings. Uh, I didn't get into things where you're, PAD does not equal or represent your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, whether it's COPD, mitral stenosis, mitral regurg, um, pulmonary embolus. There's a number of things that can affect where you may have to actually do a wedge. Uh, and sometimes it can be very difficult if somebody has severe pulmonary hypertension to get an accurate uh, wedge. But I digress a little bit. So there is more, certainly more to these catheters. I just wanted to provide a brief overview so that if somebody says, hey, we're going to start getting PA catheters that you'll at least have some basic information of what it's all about. All right, guys, thanks a lot. If you like the video, hit the thumbs up. It would help my channel. And if you found the information helpful or useful, consider subscribing to the channel. And if you do, remember to turn on notifications so that you don't miss when the next video comes out. All right, guys, thanks so much. We'll see you in the next video.